All right, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, Joel Evan here from the Biohacking Congress, and I'm here with Dr. Nathan Bryan. And let's just, why, can you just introduce yourself and yeah. just kind of talk about, um, you know, I missed your talk yesterday, but we were just talking outside, and you were giving me a earful uh, about nitric oxide. But um, yeah, maybe you could just introduce yourself and just kind of talk about um, your background and how sure. you got into this miracle, uh, not nutrient, molecule. molecule yeah. yeah. So I'm a Texas boy. I grew up in, in Texas. I got a degree in biochemistry from the University of Texas at Austin. And then I went to LSU School of Medicine where I finished a PhD in molecular and cellular physiology. Uh, spent, I guess, three years in Boston training at the Boston Medical Center and then came back to the University of Texas Medical School in Houston where I was uh, on faculty, a professor of uh, molecular medicine for a number of years, but really just studying nitric oxide. Um, it was discovered back in the late 70s, early 80s. A Nobel Prize was awarded in 1998. Um, so my research program was designed to figure out how does the human body make nitric oxide, what goes wrong in people that can't make it, what mm. are the clinical consequences, then how do we fix this? And over the course of the past 20 years, we've made a number of discoveries. I have uh, several dozen issued patents, and we've commercialized that technology now. So if your body can make nitric oxide, we do it for you. And we're seeing really some amazing results from, you know, everything's about blood flow. And nitric oxide is what controls and regulates blood flow to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. Without nitric oxide, without blood flow, your body can't perform. Uh, cells become dysfunctional and you get sick. So this is kind of what I figure and I think the science corroborates that. It's um, your body cannot and will not heal without nitric oxide. Okay, wow. All right, I'm curious too, you know, like you said, discovered in the 70s, 80s, right? right? It was Nobel Peace Prize, I remember that. Um, what made you continue or like, it, why, you know, it could have just stopped there. Like, yeah, it was discovered and we know it's great, but why, what made you so fascinated? Like, yeah, I wanna learn, there, there's more to this. Well, the, the turning point for me was when I was a student uh, in Shreveport at LSU, Lou Ignaro came and gave a lecture and he was one of the gentlemen who shared the Nobel Prize in 98. And this was, I think, in around 2000 or 2001. And I had a chance to have dinner with him that night, and he was, you know, we knew it was an important discovery, but there was still so much that we didn't know, the scientific community didn't know. Like, how does the body make it? What mm -hmm. goes wrong in people that can't? So basically, that's what I set out to put my research program around. The problem was nitric oxide's a gas, and it's produced in the lining of the blood vessels, and it's gone in less than a second. Mm. So this creates some really major hurdles in terms of diagnosing, and creating safe and effective nitric oxide technology. How do you create a gas and recapitulate the gas in a body that's gone in less than a second? Yeah, we'll How make a you? long story short. <laughs> well, we figured that out. Yeah, we'll yeah, talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but really my work was trying to figure out, develop analytical techniques that could detect nitric oxide gas. And so we developed those techniques and that armed us with really a lot of information so we could then figure out Nitric, we, we call it a fingerprint of NO biology in many different diseases from diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, and then figure out what's going wrong with the nitric oxide production pathways. And then once we understood that, to the extent we could correct it and develop technology to overcome that. Okay, very cool. One, and one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, uh, how it is created. So, and, and so yeah, how is it, how is it created? Because if we know how it's created, then right. let, let's make more, right? right? And yeah. especially if it's a foundational thing, like you said, I always think of nitric oxide coming back from like a bodybuilding, like, you know, NO, and I, that was a big popular thing, or even sexual function, right? We know right. like nitric oxide, if you're not making that, then um, you're gonna have some, that's why Viagra and all these other, you know, pills are so popular. So, but yeah, so why are, um, how is it made? And then we can kind of talk about, um, you know, why I mean, most people, why they're having difficulty making that's it. Right. Yeah. Well, the first pathway to be discovered was through uh, an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. That enzyme takes L-arginine, converts it to nitric oxide. The problem with that pathway is it becomes really inefficient the older we get, and that's called endothelial dysfunction. And as you mentioned, you know, in the really early 90s, late 90s, there was a bunch of products for the um, so-called muscle heads, the pump products, the arginine-based yeah. products. By the way, L-arginine, that's, that's a popular supplement. But is it really as efficacious? No, it's not. Okay, it's, in go. fact, it's, it's never the rate limiting step in nitric oxide production because it's a semi-essential amino acid, meaning you make it through the urea cycle and you get it from the breakdown of protein. So there's never a condition where there's arginine deficiency. So mm. supplementing arginine does not fix the problem. We have to recouple the enzyme 
and then you, your body can convert endogenous arginine. So those products typically don't work until people save your money. Um, so that was the first pathway to be discovered, and then more recently, maybe 20 years ago, it was discovered that um, you know the mechanism of action of like a Mediterranean-based diet, Japanese diet, plant-based diet, and the cardioprotective effects of that, and even anti anti-cancer effects were due to the nitrate content. And then nitrate can be converted to nitrite by oral bacteria. And then when you swallow your own saliva, you generate nitric oxide gas. So mm -hmm. those, that really created a way that you could intervene and enhance nitric oxide through diet and nutrition. And that's really the best approach is, you know, give the body what it needs, the body heals itself. Yeah. Give the body what it needs, let it make nitric oxide. But we have to understand the limitations of those pathways. So number one, if you have endothelial dysfunction, you can't convert arginine to nitric oxide. If you're not getting enough nitrate from your diet, because you're not eating enough green leafy vegetables, you become nitric oxide deficient. If you're using mouthwash or antibiotics to kill the oral microbiome that are responsible for generating nitric oxide, you become nitric oxide deficient. If you're using antacids mm -hmm. to inhibit stomach acid production, you become nitric oxide deficient. So those are kind of, you know, I like to say, to enhance nitric oxide production, you gotta do two things. Stop doing the things that disrupt it and start doing the things that promote it. That includes fluoride toothpaste, antiseptic mouthwash, antacids. you got to stop that. And then throw in some more green leafy vegetables, moderate physical exercise, infrared sauna, and then if all else fills, then uh, we have technology that can do it for you. Okay, very cool. So most common mistakes then, would you say, for people that are having issues or their pathways are blunted or just not working properly is is some of the things you just mentioned, the antacids, the, the yeah. oral mouthwash, um, anything else? And then, of course, diet, right? That's huge. Yeah, look, it's, I mean, it's a complex science, but at the end of the day, it's very simple. It's diet and yep. lifestyle. Yep. And we can't blame it on genetics anymore because now we can turn genes on and off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, 200 million Americans wake up every morning and use mouthwash. 200 million wow. Americans have an unsafe elevation in blood pressure. It's not a coincidence. Um, 200 million prescriptions are written for antacids every year. Mm -hmm. It's a problem. That's not even counting the over-the-counter medication so you know I think people have good intentions and try to do the right things but they're you know there's collateral damage and unintended consequences of mouthwash you have to stop using mouthwash we've published on this a number of other people you use so mouthwash passionate. your blood pressure goes up if you use mouthwash you lose the cardioprotective benefits of exercise it's like the worst thing you can do wow and so we, we see we've seen people that when they when they become aware of the science and the published studies and they stop using mouthwash their blood pressure will begin to normalize. Wow. They throw in a more greenly, I mean, and you can get people off prescription medications. And that's never happened in the history of medicine. You have to, the human body is not designed to take synthetic drugs. And it's never a discussion from the patient and the physician, how do I get you off drugs? It's like, I'm going to give you this drug and then come back and I'll probably give you more. Yes. Uh, so this is for the first time we're seeing the opportunity to get people off of medications. And once you do that, the body can actually heal and do what it's designed to do. Okay, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, okay, and one of the things you mentioned too though is, yeah, eat green leafy vegetables, don't do mouthwash. Okay, let's say people are doing this, but you mentioned like that pathway could still be you know, yeah. destroyed or blunted, right? Still, even they're doing all these right things, they're adding in these lifestyles, but they're still seeing the issues. What do they do next, or is there a solution? Yeah, there are, there are solutions. So I'll just take one step back. We published in 2015 because we wanted to provide some answers to some fundamental questions like, okay, how much broccoli or celery or spinach would I need to eat to get sufficient nitrate to manage my blood pressure? Yeah. So we went to five different cities across the U.S., went to New York, Raleigh, Chicago, Dallas, and Los Angeles. And we just brought, bought vegetables off the shelf. We brought them back to the lab and analyzed them. And we found that there's as much as a 50-fold difference in the nitrate content of celery in Dallas versus New York. Wow. So there's regional differences, and it's farming practices, it's soil conditions, it's lightning storms that fix the nitrogen. And those are conventionally grown vegetables. So we also compared them to organically grown vegetables, and they have about you know 50 times less nitrate than conventional. Wow, so interesting. So it's very difficult to eat enough organic vegetables to get enough nitrate to normalize your blood pressure. So that creates a whole another problem that you can do all the right things with a good intent and eat a plant-based diet or throw in some more green leafy vegetables, but it doesn't guarantee you're going to get the nitrate content that's needed to 
make nitric oxide. Yeah. So the solution is, you know, there's standardized nitrate uh, capsules or products out there that people can take. So it takes the guesswork out. So, yeah, talk about that because I was just getting an, I was just getting a knowledge dump outside about some of your products. Really cool. Some skin. There's some skincare, yeah. uh, topical stuff of, of, of NO or nitric oxide, and then there's also the, the pills. So yep. you can kind of talk about that as being the next solution. Well, and then I'd also be curious, like, what are you seeing in terms of like duration? Like how, how fast yeah. or how long should people be on these things? Well, you know, just like everything, it's been an evolution. I've been in the basic science for, I guess, more than 20 years. And so we've learned a lot over those 20 years. So we know how to make nitric oxide. And so we've commercialized that and, and productized that for over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. So our thought is, number one, you have to realize what goes wrong in individuals that can't make nitric oxide. What's their problem? And then we can fix that. So it's just, it's not too dissimilar from, you know, if you're low in vitamin D, what do you do? You take vitamin, vitamin D, D yeah. right? Same thing, if you're low in magnesium, you take magnesium. If you're low in nitrate from, uh, from not knowing the vegetables you're eating or supplying that, then we can supply that. If your body can't make nitric oxide, we developed an orally disintegrating tablet that when you put in your mouth, it slowly falls apart and it generates nitric oxide gas. And so we can see within 10 seconds of putting that lozenge in your mouth, we can see if we had an ultrasound, we can see your carotid arteries open up. We see that effect will last, uh, you know, four to six hours. But we see an improvement in uh, performance, exercise performance, sexual performance, cognitive performance. So it's all about blood flow. Mm -hmm. So once we knew that we could make nitric oxide, then the question becomes, what are the other applications? And just like the failing heart, if you don't get enough blood supply to the heart, the heart fails. If you don't get enough blood supply to the skin, what happens? The skin fails. Right. What does that look like? Well, you lose hydration, you lose collagen, fine lines and wrinkles, you get uh, acne, you get dermatitis. And so we developed a topical nitric oxide that when you combine these two chambers, mix it together, generates nitric oxide gas, it diffuses into the dermis, it opens up blood vessels, recruits capillaries, and we can basically push blood flow wherever we apply that. And when you improve oxygen nutrient delivery to the skin, you get cellular turnover, regeneration, old skin cells die off, replace it with new functional ones, the barrier function improves, fine lines and wrinkles disappear, and the tone, texture, and clarity of the skin improves. It's wow. transformational. We've got four published clinical trials on that, and it's really a transformative uh, result just from doing the basics of restoring nitric oxide production. It's incredible. Uh, you know, I was... I was talking outside actually I have a client uh, I do health coaching and um, you know she has an anal fistula fistula yeah. so I'd love yeah. to talk to you about that and seeing if there's any success stories or if you think that'd be a great um, you know that'd be something that this product could actually help with and I know um, we were talking outside and like I, I believe I can't remember if it was your, your your father or someone who had hemorrhoids yeah and and use your product right and it, and it the doctor said, sorry, like, this is what you have. Like, yeah. you're going to have hemp. Like, you, there's nothing we can do for you. But you didn't like that answer. And uh, that's right. So, yeah, can you maybe talk about that? Well, again, we're, we're taking this technology to the next level. So we've, we've been very successful in the nutrition, dietary supplement space, the skin care and beauty. Uh, but now we're taking this through FDA-approved clinical trials. So for skin care and beauty, we can affect the, you know, the texture, tone, and clarity of the skin. But we can't make drug claims. But we know this technology is so powerful, we've seen it. So we now we now have a, a drug in phase three clinical trials for COVID. I wanted uh, to talk to you about that. So cool. And then we yeah. have uh, where we just submitted a drug application, an investigative new drug application for topical wounds. So whether it's anal fistulas, mm -hmm. we're we're going after diabetic ulcers. But the etiology of the wound is all the same. To heal a wound, whether it's an anal fistula or a diabetic ulcer or a pressure ulcer, or just a cut. Yeah. You have to get blood flow to that wound and you have to kill the infection. And the nitric oxide does both. It kills the bacterial infections and it gets blood flow to the wound. So you basically, the body can heal itself. That's amazing. And so the problem in, especially diabetics, is they have reduced blood flow. If they get a wound, it can't heal because there's no blood flow to that side. Yeah. So we can overcome that. And we're seeing, you know, three-year-old non-healing ulcers that we can heal in 90 days. So it's, it's, I mean, it's really incredible. Wow. It, this will change the uh, the face of healthcare for the next fifty years. I predict. I no, and I'm. I mean, just th this client that I'm working with right now with this this fistula, like you have no idea, like how much she's been dealing with this for 
several years and I'm just thinking like, oh my God, like just to give this person some relief, yeah. man. It, it, for people that don't know this, it's like, it's like leaking like pus, you know, out of like, a, out of her anus, right? And yeah. it's like, she has to, it's con constant inflammation. Like no matter what she does, like changing her diet and doing this, it's just not getting, it, it's an open wound. It's just, yeah. and it will not heal. And uh, man, that, that just, yeah, that's, that's, that is, that is very neat. Um, okay. You mentioned uh, the C word. Yeah. Uh, COVID. Obviously, we know, like, everyone's been talking about it. What do we see? Endothelial dysfunction, metabolic dysfunction. People are getting wrecked by this virus. Yeah. So, yeah, what, have you, what can you say or what have you seen by just supplementing with nitric oxide and how that's improved people's health? Well, we're not supplementing with the nitric oxide, and this is actually mm. a drug trial. Okay. Uh, so it's an FDA-approved clinical trial. We had to go through an investigative new drug application. But to me, early on, you know, even in March or April of 2020, at the earliest stages of the pandemic, it was obvious to me that the people that were getting sick from COVID and dying from COVID were the same people who got sick and died from the seasonal flu. Right. It's not that different. It's a respiratory virus. And the people that have high blood pressure, diabetes, smokers, the elderly, people with a prior heart attack, those were the people that were susceptible to COVID infection. And not coincidentally, those are the patients that are nitric oxide deficient. So from 15 years ago, we knew that nitric oxide inhibits virus replication, specifically the coronavirus replication. Mm. So how it normally works in a healthy person, if we're exposed to coronavirus or the flu or RSV, those bugs typically attach to the airway epithelium. Our body recognizes that. We elicit a robust immune response. We mobilize our immune system. We go to the site of infection, we generate a lot of nitric oxide and it shuts down virus replication. So it kills it. Mm -hmm. So it never replicates, it doesn't propagate. So uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but yeah. so in any, if, you, if anybody's just to get sick or has a virus or something like that, would this be like the step, like number one thing you would do Absolutely. is like, let's start supplementing to. with NO. Yeah. Okay, amazing. And especially if it's a respiratory virus, when you put the lozenge in your mouth, you can breathe, deliver the NO gas directly into the airway mm -hmm. and it shuts down the viral replication. Could you also do that? Could you do NO then, like before bed? Would that matter? Or if you wanted, if your sinuses and things you couldn't breathe, would that you could. Be there's okay? some, yeah, there's some other companies who are developing a nasal uh, spray, a nebulized mist, uh, that's been shown effect in, for for coronavirus infection. Okay. Um, but the problem is, if you're nitric oxide deficient, you don't elicit our immune response. You mm -hmm. don't kill the virus. The virus replicates, propagates throughout the body. It affects oxygen delivery. You get hypoxic. You put on a vent, and you die. Yeah, that's that's the sequence of events. So our objective was if we recognize the patients that are highest risk, which are older African-Americans and Hispanics with an underlying cardiovascular issue, then within 72 hours of exposure onset of symptoms, we initiate the drug therapy. It's called an early treatment. And then we follow them for 30 days and we're keeping people out of the hospital. We're keeping them off a vent and we're keeping them alive. Yeah. So this isn't a repurposed drug. It's a, it's a rationally designed drug to get to the root cause of coronavirus. So things like remdesivir don't work because those were old drugs repurposed. Um, you know, so this, we think, is going to change the course of coronavirus. We just have to complete the study and uh, let the data speak for itself, and hopefully we'll have the drug approved. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. Um, I also wanted to ask you, because I work with a lot of clients with just metabolic issues, Diabetes, yeah. um, high blood pressure, that's usually, they usually go side hand, hand in hand. So if someone is, obviously we want the diet and the lifestyle and all that, and that's some of the things that I implement with these clients, but if they're just doing the NO, are you seeing some like pretty remarkable improvements? And, and, and typically like how long? Would it be uh, three months of just supplementing with them? And I'm just kind of curious like what, you're, what you guys have anecdotally seen or maybe- you know. Well, we've seen it anecdotally, but we've also seen it and we published on it. Uh, in 2009, we we kind of finished out the insulin signaling pathway. So you need nitric oxide for insulin signaling and glucose uptake. Again, in diabetics, they can't make nitric oxide, so they become insulin resistant. Insulin resistance first, shuts down nitric oxide production, then you get full-blown diabetes, you further suppress nitric oxide production. Because you need nitric oxide to signal glucose uptake. Mm -hmm. You don't have nitric oxide, GLUT4 doesn't translocate, and you limit uh, the glucose uptake. So what do you get? You get hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, yep. and diabetes. And then you get the vascular complications of diabetes. Right. So what we found was if you restore nitric oxide, you can enhance glucose uptake, you can potentiate the insulin signaling pathway, 
hypoglycemia, or hyperglycemia improves, hyperinsulinemia improves, and you get better management of blood sugar. Yeah. But you have to change the problem. Yes. Right? You have to change yeah. the lifestyle. So if you continue doing what you were doing that puts you in that, it's, it's, like, it's a vicious cycle. Right. We can recover that, but we can't fix it until yeah. you fix it. Yeah. So we see, you know, really great results with, you know, whether it's, and again, these are dietary supplements that are not intended to treat, prevent, cure, diagnose disease. But right. anecdotally, we see the improvements in metabolic syndrome. Yeah. One of my patents yeah. is on a method of reducing triglycerides. Mm. Another patent on methods of reducing C-reactive protein, the inflammation that occurs mm -hmm. with metabolic disease. Yeah. So we know that it works. We have issued patents on that to demonstrate that it works. Um, but yeah, everybody's different. So what we, what we say is usually if you're otherwise healthy, one a day is probably sufficient. Uh, just kind of keep your levels titrated mm -hmm. up. If you have metabolic disease or any other issue, then typically you need two to three a day because you're a little bit more compromised in your ability to generate nitric oxide. Yeah. What about because because you're actually affecting that pathway, the GLUT4 pathway, and with people that can't make the insulin correctly, are you, is this actually helping people even with type one diabetes? Yeah, whether it's type one or type two, I mean, whether you're insulin dependent or insulin independent, yeah, insulin still has to do its job. Its end function is to increase glucose uptake through GLUT4 right. translocation. Okay. We need nitric oxide for both of that. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, and there now there are a number of you know type one insulin dependent diabetics that are now insulin resistant. Mm. Uh, so we can we have to fix that and mechanistically we know how to do that yeah very cool w one last question with because you mentioned athletes i would imagine yeah have you seen a lot of professional athletes or just anybody in terms of professional athletes that are using this no and i remember uh, a long uh, a while back this they were talking about how uh athletes were supplementing with viagra prior yeah. to uh in you know events because yeah the nitric oxide right so yeah i'm curious what you guys have seen or noticed well, Viagra works downstream of nitric oxide, and so I think there's a misconception that Viagra is a nitric oxide donor. It's not. It, drugs like Viagra are dependent upon nitric oxide production. So in patients that can't make nitric oxide, Viagra doesn't work. Mm. And in fact, 50% of the men that are prescribed Viagra don't respond with better erections. The reason for that is, is their the blood vessels don't make any nitric oxide to prime that pathway. So if you restore nitric oxide production, you can take non-responders to Viagra and make them responders, or you can titrate down the dose to make them safer. But the end result, whether athletes are using the Viagra, the net result is, provided you can make nitric oxide, is you get dilation of blood vessels, improved oxygen and nutrient delivery, you get better mitochondrial function, you become more efficient, you get less lactic acid buildup, and you just perform better, and you yeah. have faster recovery. So. I mean, you don't have to use Viagra because you can use nitric oxide to get those effects, but it's huge in, in performance in sports. We have um, you know, a number of professional NCAA teams that have used our technology in the, in the past, continue today. Um, we published in 2007 the benefits of altitude training. Mm. Aren't just the erythropoietin and hematocrit increase. So we, we measured people that live in Tibet, the 12,000 feet above sea level. We live, measure people who live in Ethiopia, which is 6,000 feet above sea level. And their steady state plasma levels of nitrite nitrate are, you know, in Tibet, they're 50 to 100 times higher than they are in the U.S. In Ethiopia, they're intermediate there. Mm -hmm. So when you take a well-trained athlete to altitude, the adaptive response of that is you're breathing in less oxygen per inspiration because the partial pressure of oxygen is less. But yet, that tells your body, I need to generate nitric oxide mm -hmm. to improve oxygen delivery to that tissue. So when you train at altitude, you upregulate your nitric oxide production. And then when you come back down to sea level, you are like a well-oiled machine, and you're just spitting out nitric oxide, and you improve your performance. Wow. A couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up, see how much time we have. We can do maybe do some lightning round questions. I'm curious, because I didn't really talk too much about it, but you mentioned it, and I got a chance to see the NO uh, topical cream Topic, yeah. and how it, like, it's actually really neat. It starts to, like, fizz up. You can see, like, the bubbles, and then it, like, leaves this, like, not a rash, but, like, this, like... Uh, it's you, pink, yeah. It's pink. It's, yeah. A, it's like a heat, because it's generating heat, right? And you're generating that um, that um, circulation, like, right? That's right. Um, so, yeah, we, talk, and we, we talked about the fistula and just some other stuff, but... What, um, yeah, what have you seen um, other than just like wrinkles or anything? Are there any like any of the other big testimonials or that you that like stick out for you that just by using the topical NO that you, you guys saw? Well, it's, I mean, skincare and beauty is a multi billion dollar industry. People pay 
more money for vanity and aesthetics yeah. than they do on a lot of other things. Yeah. Who cares and about the, the thing about, oh my God, that's do right. I look nice? Yeah. The problem is most skincare products are maskers, right? Yep. They hide the wrinkles, they hide the acne. Uh, what we do is we get to the root problem because the root problem of anything is lack of blood flow. And the beauty of the, our, yeah. our nitric oxide serum is you don't have to guess if it's working or wonder if it's working. As you mentioned, you can see you it see working. It, yeah. So when you mix these two together, it generates the nitric oxide gas. You can see it bubble, but that gas diffuses into the skin where it basically opens up blood vessels. And so we're basically perfusing, it's called hyperemia, or improved blood flow to that area where you apply it. And so we're flooding that area with oxygen and nutrients, everything the body needs to make a new cell. So you improve cellular turnover, cellular regeneration, and things improve. So not just the kind of the aesthetics of it and fine lines and wrinkles, um, you know, we've got a number of uh, studies showing that uh, acne, although it's not an FDA-approved drug for acne, but, you know, we see anecdotally and clinically that uh, that improves. Um, you know, people get creative and they apply it uh, to other parts of the body where they want uh, to increase. Yeah, I did blood. ask about uh, sexual function and uh, your, uh, who, who's Susan. Susan? Susan, yeah. She was saying, um, she's like, well, yes. She's like, although we technically can't say that, but I yeah. think you guys are on the process of actually, because of uh, the FDA regulations That's and right. stuff, it's, it's considered some kind of... Uh, uh, it's a device, medical device. Medical device, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so she was saying, we, we, we do, it does work. And, yeah. yeah, but look, it's all about blood flow. Yeah. If you can't dilate the blood vessels to get engorgement, whether it's in the penis or the clitoris, then you can't get engorgement and you have sexual dysfunction. Yeah. So nitric oxide dilates blood vessels, causes engorgement. Uh, so topically, we can we can see some effects. I mean, there's a limit of diffusion of nitric oxide into that tissue. Um, but, you know, we've seen, we've heard it from a number of people yeah. that it, it works quite nicely. Yeah. But I tell people it's it's the same. It gets the wrinkles yeah. out, right? Right. Yeah, that's why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for the wrinkles. <laughs> what, what about if I, got, like, I had like a sore neck or something like that? I throw some on the cream topically. Would that would it have any effect in terms of like pain? I'm curious. Um, probably, I mean, there's different types of pain. There may be mm -hmm. like neuromuscular pain, which yeah. it's not going to affect. There's things called ischemic pain, which means there's reduced blood flow. Like the best example is angina. People with coronary artery disease, they develop yeah. the ischemic pain of angina. And you give them nitroglycerin because it generates nitric oxide and it opens yep. up the, the blood vessels. But topically, if there's some type of ischemic pain or loss of regulation of blood flow to a specific part, then the, the topical will work. If it's anatomical or a nerve impingement or neuromuscular, right. it's probably not gonna affect that. Yeah, okay. Cool. Um, before we jump into some lightning round questions, is there anything I didn't ask you that you, you wish I had? Um, no, I think, like, we've covered a lot. I mean, the, yeah. the, the frustration for me is, you know, the science of nitric oxide is very clear. There's over 175,000 scientific papers published on this molecule. Um, but, you know, the frustration is, you know, most physicians don't know anything about it. Therefore, their patients don't know anything about it. There's no standard medications, I mean, we hope to change that, we will change that, uh, to, to make it part of the primary discussion on why people aren't performing optimally. Why, you know, for me, the biggest, uh, the biggest impact we can have is to keep people from getting sick. The only way to do that is to prevent the age-related decline in nitric oxide production. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not, the science is clear. The problem is the awareness and the education. Yeah. So, and I think that's the beauty of what you do is we can reach the masses and get people to understand the importance of nitric oxide, what they can do to, you know, get out of the way, let the body do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. And you can see it's such a potent molecule that people will see the difference immediately. Yeah. It's that remarkable. I love what you said too in the beginning because I'm a big believer in that. The body knows how to heal itself. It just needs the right input. Yeah. Give the body the right input, it will heal on its own. It That's knows right. what to do. Get out of its way, right? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, one one last thing. Any um, any exciting projects that you're working on right now that you can just kind of talk about? I mean, I know you got a lot of like research and things down the line. Yeah. Well, for me, the biggest thing is, um, you know, I'm a drug discovery chemist, biochemist. So I got into this business over 20 years ago to understand <clears throat> human disease to the extent that we could fix it. And the way you do that is through, I mean, in academia, everything's about drug development. Yeah. But in historically drug development was based on restorative pharmacology. Give a synthetic drug that inhibits a specific biochemical reaction. I don't subscribe to that because there's adverse reactions to every drug. Our body's not missing drugs, right? Right. So we, we, I've always utilized this concept of restorative physiology. So give the body what it needs, 
get out of its way, the body heals itself. We know how to do that with nitric oxide. Yeah. So I think my legacy play in academia is going to be if we can get our drugs approved through FDA because there's no adverse events because it's a naturally occurring molecule. Your body sees this every day, yep. so we can restore its production and function at levels that the body is normally used to seeing. So we're, we're very excited about finishing our COVID drug study. Um, you know, we're moving in different areas. COVID's a moving target. It's become too political, and you can't bet the drug company on COVID drugs. So yeah. we're, we've got an investigational drug application for a condition called ischemic non-obstructive coronary artery disease. It's a growing condition. It affects women primarily more than men, hmm. but it's a small vessel disease. So patients present with, you know, shortness of breath, these symptoms of a heart attack, but mm. when you take them to the cath lab, you know, their big blood vessels are completely open, but the small blood vessels that perfuse the myocardium, so it's a, it's a microvascular disease. We've seen great results with that, so uh, we're going to start a drug trial on, it's called Anoka, and then taking our topical to the next level and developing a, a topical drug for diabetic ulcers. Mm. I mean, and, and chronic wound care, because there's been no innovations in wound care for 50 years. People treat wounds the same they do today as they did 50 years ago. Negative pressure and, <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so we think we're going to have a huge impact and really change the management of chronic wounds once we get our topical drug and clinical trials. Yeah, that's awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. One of the things you said, it actually reminded me of uh, Dr. Robert Rowan. You know him? The, yeah. The, was on, yeah. He said to me, he goes, Joel, I will... Um, I'm willing to make a bet with you. He's like, I'll make you a hundred dollar bet right now if you can name a pharmaceutical that's ever cured a disease. And he says he's made this bet over and over again. He's like, I've never had anybody actually, uh, you know, take my hundred dollars. Right. So I just thought it was funny with kind of what you were saying. Actually, he said there's some there's some like technicality, like some some somebody out of there out of the world was like actually, but he's like other than that, it doesn't no happen, one, either. yeah, it's never happened. So, um, all right. Hopefully, I have a little bit more time for just a couple quick lightning round questions. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if if the old you could see the new you, what would the new you say? Well, stay the course. I mean, the longer I live, the more I realize that um, I really had very little input in this journey. I think God puts people in our life at certain times and allows us to pivot to go on this journey. Um, but it's you know, with any journey, there's challenges. You know, there's days you wake up and go, "Am I doing the right thing? <laughs> yeah. Is this the right path?" Uh, but you got to have faith, and you got to you got to stay the course. Yeah. Because I think um, we all have a purpose, and we have to realize that purpose, and then um, go for it. Yeah, I love that. I'm curious, what are some choices that you think that you made that made you who you are today? <clears throat> well. I grew up in a small town in, in Texas, a country boy, and my parents divorced when I was a very young kid, and uh, my dad suffered a car accident in 1984, and then I was, I think, 11 or 12, my brother was 12 or 13, and we had to go to work, mm. and it's helped to pay the bills, and then, you know, at 15 and 16, my brother and I moved out, we got our own apartment, I finished high school, you know, had my own apartment, so I, I developed a sense of independence. Wow. Uh, very early on. I was the only kid in high school who could sign my own report card because I didn't have parents around. Wow. <clears throat> but I knew, I think, uh, there was a work ethic that was instilled early on in me, and I'd, um, I knew that I was either going to have to be an entrepreneur or something because I don't like people telling me what to do, and I'm not a very good employee. <laughs> so I knew I was going to have some challenges if I didn't figure this out. Yeah. Because I don't I, lo I love the independence and the, the creativity of, you know, asking any question that you can want in medicine or science and as a basic science, since I can design any experiment to answer any question that I have. So that intellectual independence and curiosity is what drives me. And I don't need mm -hmm. other people telling me how to think or what to do. Ah, man, I love that. That is amazing. Uh, I'm curious because, you know, you're such a force in the health and wellness world. Like, who, who, do you, who inspires you? or anybody that you follow out there? I know a lot of people, like I, when I interview like in the academia world, it's usually like, not really, but I can tell you all these PhD researchers because I read a lot of studies and stuff. Well, you know, early on, I think, um, you know, Bob Furchcott was one of the guys who shared the Nobel Prize, and he was just such an humble guy and made, you know, it's, he made observations. 
in the lab and then he made interpretations of those observations that were spot on. Uh, and that I think that changed vascular biology. Uh, he, he discovered this, what's he called, endothelium derived relaxing factor. So I think professionally, you got people like that who are just really creative and really astute observers and then mm -hmm. understand the importance of that observation. Um, and then to be humble. Most people in academia aren't humble. They're arrogant, they're difficult to deal with, they're socially <laughs> awkward. <laughs> so yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's a problem in, in academia. Um, on a personal level, there are a number of people who inspire me. My dad, for one, he's, you know, he's 74 years old this year. He spent uh, over half his life in a wheelchair as a paraplegic. Um, mm. But you know he gets up every day and you know trudges on and yeah. you know paraplegics typically don't live that long. But you know using these fundamentals that um, we've discovered along with some other things, we he's in great health. Uh, yeah. And when I think I'm having a bad day, I always think, well, you know what? It could be worse. I could be in a wheelchair rolling around and not have my uh, freedom and independence. Mm. So yeah, he's an inspiration, and you know there a number of other people that inspire me. Yeah, that is, that's, that's so good. Thank you. Um, I'm a big reader. Are there like a top like one to three books that had a huge impact on your life that you recommend other people go out and read? You know, I read nonfiction because um, I like to read kind of the history of discoveries. Um, I read, st you know, books from like uh, you know, the discovery of the structure of, of DNA because as a scientist I want to know what was the sequence of events that made them to make those observations and not only make the observations but realize the importance of it at that time yeah that epiphany that aha moment um more recently i'm reading more on you know i've always focused on nitric oxide i used when i was in full-time academia i would read 20 to 40 papers scientific papers a week yeah and that'll wear you out yeah. you know it's important <laughs> because you learn a lot but yeah. then i thought okay i need to learn some things outside of uh, of my kind of uh, microcosm. Uh, this bioenergetics medicine, you know, there's a good buddy and colleague of mine named Jerry Tennant in Dallas. He's got a book called uh, Healing is Voltage. Mm. And it talks about us being humans as being energetics. And, you know, it's like a battery. You lose your charge over time, and then if you don't restore it and replete it, you die. So through bioenergetics, and, you know, there are a number of devices and modalities here at the Biohacking Conference that basically understand that and basically give you. Uh, the voltage back. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can walk barefoot on the earth, which is the biggest magnet uh, in our universe, and we can recharge. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm trying to learn more outside the nitric oxide field. And But here's here's what I've learned, that people get sick for two reasons and two reasons only. It doesn't matter if it's diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, or cancer. Your body's missing something that it needs or it's exposed to something that it doesn't need. Mm -hmm. And so in that model, there's no room for pharmaceuticals. So, right, you get rid of the toxins and you replete what's missing, the body heals itself. I I've seen that. it work over and over again. I love that. One of my mentors, uh, Dr. Jay Davidson, uh, I don't know if you know him from, from Cellcore and, he, and uh, Dr. Tyler Was, he talks about, guys, we're always trying to over supplement with these things. He's <laughs> like, well, here's, here's the deficiency or the toxicity. Let's just remove the toxicity so it's creating the deficiency and now you don't have to over supplement. You, yeah, can, right. you can just give the body the, what it needs. So I, I love that. Last two questions and we'll wrap it up. Um, I'm, Cause you mentioned, you just mentioned grounding and some of these other things. Are there any hacks or practices or just rituals that you kind of do on a daily basis? <clears throat> yeah, I do. So I live way out in the country. I'm on 800 acres out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we grow our own beef, raise our own food. Um, and when I'm home, I mean, I travel a lot. But um, I sit in an infrared sauna every day. I heat it up to 170 degrees and I sit in there for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, I have an LED light bed that stimulates uh, mitochondria and improves energy production. I have a hyperbaric oxygen chamber at home. I take my nitric oxide. Um, Will you take yeah, the NO, by the way, before you go into any of these things? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah, you, you stack do. It. Yeah, you stack it. Yeah. So there's protocols that we can, we can potentiate the effects of any of these biohacking by simply, especially the hyperbaric. You take the nitric oxide, you open up the small blood vessels, and then the high pressure oxygen basically enhances the delivery. Mm. Same thing with the LED bed or with the infrared sauna. You know, certain wavelengths of light will liberate nitric oxide. But if you don't have any nitric oxide bound in these photo label stores, then the light therapy is going to be mitigated to some extent. Mm -hmm. So if you titrate them up, you get in the, uh, in the LED bed or the... Um, the infrared sauna 
you can liberate more nitric oxide during yeah. that sauna session. Very cool. You, actually, one last question, because I, uh, I have two boys, two, uh, eight and four. Could N, is NO, have you seen it um, as just a powerful supplement with, with children and even for like learning disorders or learning issues or ADHD or autism, anything like that? Yeah, we've have. We've got three boys. Um, the youngest two are 14 and 11. But, you know, they're athletes. They're long distance runners, track, football, baseball, basketball. <clears throat> and so even the oldest, when he was in school, we would give him either the, the beet powder or the lozenge before a basketball game or something. And you can see the performance. In fact, my middle son, Lincoln, was in a cross-country meeting. We gave the entire cross-country team the lozenge before. And all six you didn't boys, give them Capri Suns and stuff like no. you know, afterwards. Instead, you're like, why don't you guys try this? Yeah. All six boys yeah. had their per personal best. Ah. I mean, but they just, they were like well-oiled machines. So we see it. I think, you know, it's, the lozenge is made for about a, you know, 85 to 100 pound person. So if it's a you know forty or fifty pound kid, break it in half, and that way they're not getting too much, they're getting just enough. Yeah. Okay. So a lot. Typically, you've seen it then for athletic, uh, athletic purposes, That's right. but nothing. I'm just like for the brain or then because I know if you're working at that systemic level with Alzheimer's and all these other things like we talked about, then you're going to well even see some good with effects. any neurological disease, whether it's you know Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or ADHD, uh, it's a loss of regulation of blood flow to certain regions of the brain. Right. And so you get these excitatory neurotransmitters, and so it's a compensation. So if you restore blood flow and allow those neurons to then function, to give them what they need to function, mm -hmm. you know, theoretically it makes sense. And years ago we did it with severe and profound autism kids, you know, yeah. five to seven, nonverbal, self-mutilating. And when we gave them the nitric oxide, they were calm, and they started to become verbal. Mm. Wow. So we've seen that, but it makes sense because you're restoring blood flow. Yeah. But there's other problems that you probably have to address. I mean, yeah. nitric oxide is important, but it's not a silver bullet. It's not an end-all, be-all, cure-all. But I yeah. think it's clear that the body cannot and will not heal without nitric oxide. Yeah, well said. Last but not least, Dr. Nathan Bryan, uh, where can people find you and learn more about your work? Um, on social media, Dr. Nathan S. Bryan on Instagram. Uh, I've got a website, an educational website, drnathansbryan.com. I uh, do a monthly blog, try to give people some kind of practical, easy information to kind of make some slight adjustments to their lifestyle to where they can enhance nitric oxide. So, you know, we have product technology that we have out there, but my objective is to not to sell you products, but to give you the proper information and education so consumers can make informed and educated decisions. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if we, if we do all the right things, you know, as you said, the body heals itself. We just have to help it along a little bit. Yeah, love that. Awesome. Thank you, brother, for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it.